morning, everyone. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge, uh, I'll only be able to stay for part of the morning, but there's a lot of folks from the T and MassDOT and two members of our wonderful MBTA control board here who will be able to spend more time with you. Um, and, we've, and I'll try to come back this evening and very much look forward to uh, what you guys have for solutions because um, the case that I'm about to make to you is that we are the least important people in the room uh, in terms of actually influencing what happens. We being MassDOT, T, very important. MassDOT, however, well, we'll see. Um, so um, my goal is uh, three things, uh, to be deliberately provocative, um, uh, to insist that we use data, uh, not optimism, um, or the belief in inevitability, uh, to drive our decision making, and also to be ruthlessly pragmatic, because um, if the first uh, couple speakers didn't convince you of this, um, we don't have a lot of time. Um, and we need to, and it takes us a long time to fix things. Um, so one of the points that didn't get made, maybe clearly enough, is transportation is the driver of greenhouse gas emissions between now and 2050, right? So the sort of rule of thumb is 80 by 50. We need to reduce carbon 80% by 2050 if we want to be in a position so that resiliency can actually help us uh, live in places that are, uh, in fact, the kind of places we want to live in, OK? And everybody else is going down, um, and we're not. And I would make the case, based on the data I have seen, that we have few, if any, models that actually, I'm meaning models of operating programs that can produce this kind of reductions in transportation greenhouse gas emissions at this scale, OK? So again, we've been doing a lot of stuff. We flatten the curve. Uh, technology is going to help us. Demography is going to help us. None of them is going to solve it. And, um, we're not moving fast enough on making behavior change fast enough to get to this kind of thing. So let me show you what I mean by data. Okay. Um, so this, so the, one of the metrics that I track is ABC, right? Anything but cars. What percentage of travel is being made transit walking, biking? Uh, in 2012, and I'll come back to this, MassDOT set what they called a mode shift goal, which was to triple the uh, number or proportion, depending on how you uh, read that uh, policy directive, of trips being made by walking, biking, and transit. An interesting goal, since we don't know what proportion of trips were being made by walking, biking, and transit at the time. But let's set that aside, and let's assume that these are the right numbers. OK, but that's trips. Carbon emissions are not proportionate to trips. Carbon emissions are proportionate to miles traveled, OK? Biking and walking trips and transit trips are short trips. Driving trips are long trips. So if we look at the exact same pie chart, not by trips, but by miles, exact same chart, that is the ABC mode share for Eastern Massachusetts based on that, the previous slide's trip. So looks great. We're at a third. We're at 40%. You saw the numbers Chris showed you. That's what it actually does to carbon. OK, so we have a long way to go. I count on all of you to come up with the answers by the end of the day. <laughs> um, one of the most important things that I have learned since becoming Secretary of Transportation is that um, agencies, state agencies, my agencies do two things. They do many things, but really at bottom they do two things. They operate stuff and they build and fix stuff. So therefore, the only two things that matter when you talk about performance is how well do we operate stuff and how well do we build and fix stuff. And everything else, more or less, is just inputs and outputs. But the outcomes are those two things. So we are terrible at building and fixing stuff. Um, the MBTA, MassDOT to a lesser degree, uh, cannot spend money that it has. So a lot of people in this room spend a lot of time, including me, fighting for more resources, which turns out to have been poured into the endless maw that was the MBTA's operating deficit without, in fact, supporting much in the way of capital investment. Um, and you know, you, you saw what Julie was talking about. You saw what Chris was talking about, which is wonderful, but relies on a huge amount of state spending. <laughs> We're friends. It's OK. Um, so five years ago, the T was spending maybe $400 million a year on the uh, upkeep and modernization of the wonderful transit system that we all inherited from those who came before us and were smart enough to build it. Um, we're not sure, because honestly, they didn't even track these numbers. These are all recreated numbers based on the best data we have. We're tracking them going forward. Uh, this year, we'll push. Uh, so you, in, that, in that chart, 
The bottom number is what matters, OK, because that's fixing the system we have. The expansion stuff is nice. I'm not opposed to expansion. But let's be real clear. When you have a system that carries 1.3 million people a day, math says that fixing the system so that 10% more people use it is the fastest way to increase ridership and therefore decrease carbon emissions, right? Because a 10% increase in ridership is 130,000 trips a day. And there is no capital project ever proposed for the MBTA that generates more than 15 to 20,000 new transit riders. New transit riders, not people getting off of one mode of transit onto another, people getting out of cars and getting onto transit, which is, again, the only thing that drives Carbon reduction, right? So we got to spend on that system to bring up the ridership. We were spending maybe 400 million this year. The T, depending on how well we do in the next 10 days, um, at the end of the fiscal year, we need one more control board meeting to vote some capital contracts. Uh, we'll spend between six and 700 million dollars. That's a near doubling of where we were five years ago. Um, we probably need to double that number again. We certainly need to hit a billion a year, um, and it wouldn't hurt if we could get it up to 1.2 uh, if we want to fix the system. Uh, and that does not include any costs for climate resiliency. So the big challenge right, is, is getting the agencies to actually figure out um, what business we're in. Um, you know, you all know the famous Peter Drucker line about um, how culture eats strategy for um, breakfast. And at uh, transportation agencies, operations eat everything. Culture, strategy, money, bandwidth, uh, everything. Um, so let's start with a really basic question. What business is MassDOT and the T in? I would argue to you that we are not in the transportation business. Chrysler is in the transportation business. Newtonomy is in the transportation business. Uber is in the transportation business, uh, although they would deny it. Um, we are not in the transportation business. Um, because the transportation, the things that move people from point A to point B, as I just showed you in the slide, overwhelmingly has nothing to do with my agency other than the fact that we put asphalt underneath tires, right? So, OK, so then maybe we're in the mobility business. That's an interesting business to be in in the year 2017 because we're in all mobility as a service and stuff. But you know, mobility asks only one question, right? Which is, how can we help people get from where, from one place to another? It's an important question, um, but it's not actually the question. If we're really serious about simultaneously improving social equity, uh, growing the economy, and reducing carbon emissions, then the question, right, the business we're in is actually helping people get what they need, which is the accessibility business, right? Big difference between helping people get where they want to be, where the keyword is the where word, and helping people get what they need. Because guess what? In 2017, getting what you need may or may not involve actually moving from point A to point B, because you can order stuff online, and you can get an education online, uh, and you can sit in your living room in your pajamas and conduct a business deal, right? So we know that movement is actually not the driver of the social utility that is transportation. Now, for any of you who, like me, started life thinking not so much about transportation, but energy use, you know that the transformative realization that changed how we think about the energy sector was when Amory Lovins said, we're not in the kilowatt business, right? We don't measure the social utility of the energy part of our economy by how much we use, which is what we used to do. Trust me, I was an advocate back in those days. People don't want kilowatts. They want heat, light, and power. Those are our measurements of social utility. Guess what? People don't want travel. No one wakes up in the morning and says, today I want to travel 36 miles. No one that I know. Maybe you know someone like that. I'd love to meet them. So we don't even have a definition yet of what is the social utility of the transportation system, which means, definitionally, that we're measuring the wrong things. We're measuring congestion. We're measuring what the level of service is at an intersection. We're measuring miles traveled as if it's kilowatts, as if more of them is good, 
as opposed to the distinct possibility that in a carbon constrained world, less of them are good, right? So we've got big changes that we need to make in our agencies because they're still thinking they're in the transportation business or maybe at best the mobility business, but they're not thinking they're in the accessibility business and they don't have the tools. They don't know anything that they need to know to be in that business. So how do we slowly start to make that pivot? Because it didn't happen overnight in energy and it's not going to happen overnight in transportation. So I'm trying to get my agencies to focus on four things. The first thing is people. People play a startlingly small role in the thinking of most transportation agencies, like what they need and where they live and where they work. Um, turns out most of the people who work most of the time, like you drive the bus, you open the door, sometimes no one's there, sometimes there's so many people that the bus pulls away full and leaves people on the curb. No intellectual curiosity about why one, one of those happens or the other happens. <laughs> A uh, friend of mine out at UC used to say, transit agencies think they're in the business of operating buses and trains. The problem is they're actually in the business of filling buses and trains, right? Well, the business of filling buses and trains is a completely different business from the business of operating because you can't fill them if you actually don't understand your, your customers, right? What they want, what they need. Um, so people, really important kind of customer centrism. It's not just a mantra. It's kind of a way of getting people to realize that every single day there are people inside those buses and trains, on those bikes, walking down those sidewalks, and driving those cars. Second is priority setting. My job would be much easier if I just said yes to everyone, including friends like Chris. Um, that would not be what the governor expects me to do, and honestly, I don't think it would be a responsible thing to do. It does not matter how much money you throw at the problem, you still actually need to set priorities. You have to decide that some things are more important than other things, whether those things are operational things or capital things. We're terrible at transportation. We would rather start 500 projects that we can't possibly deliver than admit that we're never going to build 300 of them, but do the other 200, OK? So that means changing capital planning. The third thing is performance. Um, performance means um, figuring out what does matter, what is the social utility, and um, measuring it. And I don't mean inputs and outputs, which we sort of measure a little bit. I mean outcomes. Um, let me give you an example. Commute time. Do we want to reduce commute time 10% or 50%? So what's the biggest factor in the fact that Boston has a long commute time? The percentage of people using public transit. Transit trips are longer than driving trips. In fact, a, transit, a, a driving trip, a transit trip that starts and ends in the city of Boston on average produces a longer commute than a driving trip from an origin and destination on Route 495. That's actual American Community Service census data. But transit trips have a thing that people really want in 2017, which is the possibility of productive time. Now, we create productive time behind the wheel, but it's really, really dangerous. So <laughs> you laugh, but that is the biggest driver behind safety problems in the world of uh, transportation today, is people who, because of that 30 or 40 minute car trip, have to text, have to talk on the phone, have to be doing 17 different things and dividing their brain into pieces, and they are dangerous. They are dangerous to themselves, they're dangerous to their passengers, they're certainly dangerous to other people in cars, let alone people who are walking and biking, right? But on a transit trip, right, so is it so bad to have a 30-minute transit trip where you actually can stare at a screen as opposed to a 25-minute driving trip where you can't? And if it's not, then are we measuring the wrong thing? So it's really complicated. To, to sort of understand what we should measure. And then the last piece I want to just measure is partnerships. I see Rick D'Amino standing in the back. We had a mini little example of one yesterday with the Greenway, but it wasn't little because it had been decades that we could not figure out how to provide $2 million a year to one of the nicest park spaces in the city of Boston. And now we have it figured out. And that's because a lot of people rolled up their sleeves and worked together. Um, let me give you another example of partnerships. So you all know the rule of 90-10 or 80-20, different people talk about it different ways, right? So MassDOT owns 80-90% of the, or sorry, owns 10 to 20% of the roads, but my roads have 80-90% of the trips. Cities and towns actually own 80-90% of the roads, they just only have 10 to 20% of the trips. But they have the roads that have the trips on which people walk and bike. Not that many people biking the Mass Pike. Although New York has just 
I said, New York, someone just proposed a bike lane, a separated bike lane on an interstate. Anyway, not me. Um, <laughs> the, um, so we came in. There were a dozen cities and towns in Massachusetts that had any kind of complete streets policy that said, our streets are for everyone. They need to work for people walking and biking and getting on and off buses and seniors and people in wheelchairs and little kids. Um, that's all complete streets means. It's a really powerful concept. Um, there are now uh, over 200 of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts headed in their direction. When Smart Growth America just put out their annual review of complete streets policies of the 13 best policies in the US, nine came from Massachusetts, and the best one in the country was Brockton. Okay, Not a place that you would predict, but you care about social equity, then the fact that Brockton has bet its future on complete streets is astonishing. It's because of the partnership we created at MassDOT. So real quickly, what? Let me just throw out some things for folks to think and talk about this afternoon. Buses, 170 bus routes, some of which clearly were a trolley route in 1920, uh, going from some place that's no longer in existence to another place that's no longer in existence. Um, have not taken a hard look at them pretty much in the intervening time. So Chris knows this, OK? So this is, this is literally talk about, oops, how do I go backwards? Let me see. There we go. OK, actually set metrics. That's what the control board has done. We now have six or eight quantitative metrics for each of 170 bus routes. And with the help of our partners at MIT, we have the data on every single bus route to actually understand how it is performing. Of our 170 bus routes, 131 are clearly failing our core metric, which is reliability. If we have learned one thing, one thing, it's the only thing travelers care about is frequency and reliability. They don't care about USB ports. They don't care about, I mean, it's nice to give them a nicer bus stop. Like, I'm all in favor of that. That doesn't drive ridership. Ridership is driven by frequency and reliability, and 131 of our bus routes fail our reliability metric, OK? So how do you fix a bus route? There are seven things you need to run a bus route. Driver and vehicle, the least important things. Honestly, the T controls them. They don't matter. Why? Well, if we have autonomous vehicles, drivers don't matter. And anybody, honestly, any private company, any city can put a driver and vehicle on the street. So it's nice that the T has them, but honestly, not the bedrock of a well-run bus route. You need asphalt. Don't own any of it. You need curb space. Also not mine, belongs to the cities and towns. You need the traffic signals to help the buses move ahead of the people in the single occupancy cars. Don't get to time the traffic signals on most of the bus routes. Cities and towns do. You need a place for people to wait for the bus. T has 9,000 bus stops. T owns zero bus stops, all owned by cities and towns, OK? So the four most important things <coughs> are controlled by cities and towns. If we don't have a partnership with them, we're never going to fix them. The seventh thing, I used to always say there were six. I've added a seventh, and the seventh thing is data. You actually need to understand the world in which your bus is operating. We have a lot of that, and we're happy to share it. But if we're going to get anywhere on fixing our buses, it is not going to be the T sitting at 10 Park Plaza or on a high street fixing buses. It's going to be working with a lot of other people. Uh, and data is about dashboards, and we already talked about measuring stuff. Uh, partnerships, I talked a little bit about a complete streets. Um, the ride is a federally required paratransit service. <coughs> um, our conventional ride service <coughs> costs $30 a trip. Um, has a net promoter score. By the way, no one at the team knows what it knew what a net promoter score was till a year ago or how to measure it. Um, had a net promoter score of, can you have a negative net promoter score? Okay, so definitely had a ne negative net promoter score. Um, I think on our core service, by the way, we are up to zero, so we're making huge progress on the customer satisfaction. But on the ride, when we started this partnership with Uber and Lyft, for the Uber and Lyft pilot, the net promoter score is about 91 last time I looked. Um, pretty big difference. Partnerships matter. So I promised I'd say a word on Focus 40, and then I'd stop. Um, Focus 40 is a planning process. There is a case to be made, as much as I love planning, uh, that planning is not how we're going to change things. Um, I, there's a case to be made that there are only two kinds of plans that actually matter in the short run. Uh, service plans, how we actually run our buses, which is why we're reviewing the service plans for all 170 routes. And capital plans, where we put our money in the ground. Um, which is why, honestly, in the first two years I'm secretary, we have focused on service planning at the T and capital plans at both the T and MassDOT. 
But the truth is, be in, if we are actually now not just talking about <coughs> how do we change behavior this year and next year, but we're actually talking about 80% carbon reductions by 2050, we do actually have to do the more visionary planning, the where do we want to be planning. But the thing that I would argue to you is it doesn't look like transportation planning because we're not planning for transportation. We're planning for the region we want to live in. And then we're asking, what does the transportation system look like that supports the region we want to live in? Just like Boston in Go Boston 2030 started with what does the city of Boston look like in 2030 and what kind of transportation system. So that's what Focus 40 is. Focus 40 is what does the T that supports the greater Boston of 2040 that we all want to live in look like? Again, we've had great help from the Bar Foundation. We've done a big public outreach process. But now is the time to sort of turn that part into uh, investment plans, service plans. And as Chris knows, this is really the meat of the process and the hard part. And I think, honestly, we're going to give ourselves a little more time to make sure that we uh, get it right. Uh, I will also tell you that uh, there is an RFP on the street right now um, for a commuter rail vision plan. Uh, the commuter rail is, in many ways, the most interesting part of our, transport, our regional transportation system. Understanding what it should look like is way more complicated. Um, do we think suburbs matter? How do we think autonomous vehicle changes travel behavior in the commuter serve communities, which look very differently than Boston? Do we think we should still be on diesel? Um, if we don't do this kind of planning of the T, and we went out right now to buy a new locomotive fleet, which we need 50 uh, new ones, if anyone has any parked in your um, driveway, <laughs> um, we would buy 50 new big diesel locomotives. And then for the next 50 years, we would run 50 big diesel locomotives. And that would be a huge missed opportunity to ask the question, is that actually what we want? Do we want diesel or do we want electricity? Do we want big trains or do we want small trains or do we want a mix of big trains and multiple units? So the goal is that even though, as Joe Aiello said yesterday, it's not his cup of tea, we just are going to pour about $50 million into sort of buying five or six years to have a fleet that'll work for five or six years so that we can have a couple of years to ask ourselves what the next big fleet looks like so that we don't just go out and buy 50 diesel locomotives. So um, I'm going to close with my favorite slide and segue to autonomous vehicles. This is from a Barclays report uh, on autonomous vehicles. Um, it is peak horse. Um, this is actual data. Um, I told you I love data. Um, this is actually, so the, the dark lines are horse, uh, horses per capita, and the light blue is cars per capita one century ago. Okay, So if we were all standing here, not in 2017, but we were all sitting in this room in 1917, although as we all know, we wouldn't all be sitting in this room in 1917, but that's another issue. Here's 1917. This is what the world looked like in 1917. There's no light blue lines for cars. There's just horses. And so as transportation experts, we would be debating critical issues, including to pave or not to pave, because horses don't like asphalt. But the great new technology of the early 21st century, the bicycle, loves asphalt. So the good roads movement is pressuring us all to pave our roads, even though it will make it worse for horses. Uh, that was actually the great public policy debate of 1917. So we'd be asking all the wrong questions about all the wrong things because we didn't see the car coming. Okay, And so we should talk about autonomous vehicles, and we should talk about transportation network companies, and we should talk about mobility of a service, and we should be humble and modest, not arrogant. And we should not assume that demography is destiny. We should not assume that technology is destiny. And we, above all, should not assume that we actually know what is going on. But what we should be asking ourselves is, what we know is that Boston and the region in 2030 or 2040 or 2050 are not going to be like they are today. We may not know exactly what those changes are going to look like, but we can't plan for yesterday, which is what we usually do. Or today, we do have to plan for tomorrow. So what I'm hoping is the smart people in this room working together, not just today, but going forward, can help us be smart enough so that we can come up with enough ideas at scale to really begin to make a dent in what I continue to believe is not only the transportation and economic and equity challenge of our time, but really the moral challenge of our time, which is, are we willing to allow disruptive change in order to address climate change? Thank you very much.